continue this day with Paul's letter to the church uh, at Thessalonica. A, church, a letter that is unique among all the letters that Paul writes. Because when Paul writes all the other letters, there's always a problem. There's always a disaster. In Galatia, they're having a hard time uh, with heretics coming in and teaching and leading them astray that they have to be Jewish before you can be Christian. And Paul has to quickly respond to that. It, when he writes to the church at Corinth, they, they, they're just bursting at the seams. Uh, they're having class divisions. They can't even sit down and eat a meal together. When he writes to the church at Rome, he's writing to them in part because they're, they're not quite sure they need the Jews because we're, we're Gentiles, we've got this Jesus thing, do we need the Jews anymore? And, and so Paul is always responding to a crisis, except here. This is not a crisis letter. This is Paul checking in. Hey, how you do it? This is like when you call your, your mama or you call your grandkids once a week or once a month just to say, hey, what's up? And so this is a very low-key letter compared to everything else that Paul writes. And, and so Paul starts out, there's no problem, so he's just going to start out by encouraging them. He starts out with this letter, and, and he starts out first by telling them, I'm always thinking of you. He, he writes, we are always, we, uh, Timothy, Paul, and Silvanus, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering, before, remembering you before our God and Father. Who are the people that there's not a day that goes by that you don't think or pray for them? Think about that. Who, who is always on your mind? Who are you always thinking about and praying about and worrying about? And who is it that's praying and thinking and worrying about you too? Right? This is Paul saying, that's the type of relationship I have to you. I'm not there with you right now, but I'm always praying for you. I'm not forgetting you. I'm always remembering you. And, and I don't think I've ever explicitly said this, but uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think and pray about you. That I don't give thanks for you. That I don't pray for the future of this church. Olivia can testify, I'm really bad at taking a day off because I'm always thinking about church. I'm always worrying about church. I'm always wondering about church. And I'm always praying for you. And I'm always thankful for you as Paul is for his church at Thessalonica. He is giving thanks for their uh, work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. You hear those words, faith, hope, love? He'll bring those up again. But this is what he is thankful for in that church. And what I'm thankful for in this church, your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. And so he, this is warm and fuzzy, right? And he continues in this very warm and fuzzy approach. He tells them, you are part of a chosen people. You are, and when he talks about being chosen, he's talking about a corporate identity. You are part of God's chosen people, the people of God. And, and how do you know this? You know this because of the way the gospel has changed your lives. You know this because of the way the Spirit has moved in your church. If you look at where you were and where you are now, you see the difference there? That is the power of God in your life. You are part of a chosen people of God, and the proof of it is in your life together as a church. As further proof of this, Paul points out, you've had joy in spite of the persecution. You can be excited and joyous even in the midst of things not going perfectly. To have joy even in the midst of suffering, that is one of the signs that the Spirit is moving in your life. Reading this, this, this sort of first verses, the way that Paul is reassuring them that they're not forgotten, that they're doing good, they're having their steadfastness, the faith, the hope, and love. What it reminds me of is, you know when you start something new, starting a, a new sport, or you're, you're make, and you want your coach to tell you you're doing a good job, or you make a, good res you make a recipe for the first time, you're not quite sure how it's going to turn out, and you put it in front of your family, and you think, eek. And, they, and, and you want them to tell you whether it was good or not. And then they say, yeah, Andy, that was good. We, we should have this again next week. That's what Paul's doing. He's telling this, this new church, this young church, you're doing fine. I know you're worried. I know you're not sure about yourself. You're, you're doing fine. Just, just keep on keeping on. And he is encouraging them to keep on keeping on. And what have they been keeping on at since, since Paul left them? Well, Paul tells us they've been imitating him. They have been imitating him. It's, uh, Paul writes, Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us, and thus of the Lord. You imitate me, Paul, and Silvanus, and Timothy. And when you imitate us, you are imitating Jesus. This is Paul's solution to a rather interesting challenge he faces as he starts these new churches. 
When he starts, gathers these people together, and he says, I want to tell you about Jesus, he can give them the Old Testament, if they can read. One in ten can read, so it's not likely. But if they can read, they can read the Old Testament, and that will tell them a bit about who Jesus will be, the prophecies and all that. But he can't give them a book to read, because, well, it hasn't been written. The New Testament still kind of down the road. And he can't uh, introduce them to Jesus, because Jesus is not right there. But what he can do is say, here are the stories of Jesus, watch how I live them, and then do as I do. Imitate me. Now, that's a pretty bold thing to say, right? Imitate me, do as I do? That, that, that's a little bit much, it feels like sometimes, to say, imitate me. But this is what Paul says to this church. If you're going to continue to grow as you follow Jesus, imitate me. Do what I do. Which is not a way of life we talk about often today. We don't talk about imitation because, as I said, it, it can be just a bit, well, it can feel a bit arrogant, right? You just do what I do? Uh, uh, really? Well, what we hear more often, how often do you hear people talk about, you know, just be a good person. Just do what's right. Just be a good person, right? Just do good. Or, or have you heard karma, this whole idea, you do good, good things happen to you? I hear about karma, people talking about, you know, I just believe in karma. Why doesn't Paul just say, be good? Well, the problem with saying, be good, is it doesn't really tell you much. Like, when you have to choose between having your own children or adopting children, if someone says, well, just be good, oh, thanks, that clears that right up. Or you have to choose between taking a job that can make your family a lot more money far away or staying in the community you, you grew up in, oh, just be good. Oh, oh good, that, that helps. I mean, those are some of the... You get into even the harder decisions. Do you life-saving treatment to keep someone alive or let them die peacefully? Do you have a divorce or not? I mean, you get into the hard problems of life, and when someone walks up to you and says, oh, just be good. Oh, thank you, that clears it. You know what does help? If you're in the middle of a hard... Think of the hard decisions you've had to make in your life. What was actually helpful in those moments? What would your dad have done? What would have your pastor have done? What would have your best friend have done? What would have your grandparents have done? That gives you a little bit something more to chew on, right? When you ask, what would so-and-so have done? Someone you trust and respect. That's a little bit more helpful than just saying, oh, be good. Be good, whatever. What, what would so And that's what Paul is pointing at here. Imitate. And he's saying, imitate me. And that actually is very helpful to me because, you know, we're all following Jesus, so we're imitating Jesus, we're walking in Jesus' footsteps, but there is something very intimidating about following Jesus. Because, for example, if you face that horrible question, should you have a divorce or not? Jesus would never face that question because he would never end up in a bad marriage. I mean, assuming Jesus was ever married, which is a whole, let's just not go there right now. But the idea that Jesus would be in a really hard spot and then he has to figure out his way out of? Well, he wasn't. He was perfect. Paul, though. I like Paul. Paul messed up the entire first part of his life. What was he known for before Jesus backhanded him on a horse? He was known for persecuting Christians, for getting it wrong, and for being a complete zealot for the wrong th things in life, right? Paul is someone who completely borked turned his life around and got it right. I, I can imitate that. A loser who gets his life together. Well, sometimes I look in the, mor morning, in the mirror in the morning and say, yep, I got some work to do. I can imitate Paul. It's, 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 he's far more accessible. And then in imitating Paul, he is following Jesus. I'm imitating Paul, and I'm, I'm following Paul who's following Jesus, and that seems to work. And so this is what Paul tells the church at Thessalonica. Imitate me because I'm follow, imitating Jesus. And the church at Thessalonica could do this because they knew Paul, right? They had spent months together with Paul. They had eaten with Paul. They had worked with Paul. They had worshipped with Paul. They knew what his favorite meal was. They knew how late he, he, he wanted to stay up at night. They could imitate Paul because they, they knew him. That's kind of a challenge for us, though, because we don't know Paul like this. And so if we're going to imitate someone the way that the church at Thessalonica imitated Paul, we need to imitate someone that we can know. 
And this is something we do, right? We talk about imitating people. And I do hear people talk about imitating like they want to teach like their favorite teacher. They, they want to teach for a living because that's how their, their mother taught or their favorite teacher taught. Or, or I want to be a parent like my parent was a parent. I want to be a grandparent in the same way that my grandparent was for me. I mean, we talk about imitation in that fashion. Uh, I, this shows my age. Uh, like Mike. You remember that whole Be Like Mike? They made a, whole, they made a really bad movie about that too. Be, be Like Michael Jordan. That was a, or now maybe play golf like Tiger Woods. I mean we have these, we talk about imitation. There's a whole line of books about leadership, right? If you want to, uh, was it Lincoln on Leadership? And, and so you can read all these books. You can imitate previous presidents and how they led. But what we don't talk about is imitation like Paul is talking about imitation. Imitation so that you get better at following Jesus. Imitation of the saints of the church so that we can grow in how we follow Jesus. Now, I can tell you who I follow as the saints. There are people that I want to imitate. I'm, I'm striving to imitate. Dude down at Chillicothe, John Rice. He is a pastor of Methodist Church there. That dude studies. He gets up in the morning and he reads and he studies and he, he's doing that so he can share deep and solid wisdom with his church. And I want to be more like John Rice. I want to be imitate him, one of the saints of the church. I want to imitate Peter Story, a Methodist bishop of South Africa who, who during apartheid was bold and standing up and saying, this is what is right and true in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to be as bold as Peter Story. I want to be like, uh, there's a guy named Will Campbell. He died a couple years ago. He was a pastor of the South um, during a civil rights era and afterwards in the 60s. And he was someone who always saw the person. When he would walk into the room, he could see the person before he saw race. And then he, so he could be a pastor to anyone, black, white, whatever. And then later in life, he was a pastor and he could serve Klansmen, Ku Klux Klansmen in jail because he could see them as a person first. And I want to see people like Will Campbell saw people in his life. I want to imitate, I want to see like Will Campbell sees. These are some of the saints that I want to imitate in my life. This is where I want to go. I want to be more like them in a year than I am right now. Who are the saints that you're imitating? Who do you want to be like when you grow up? Right? We're never done growing up, are we? Who do you want to be like? A year from now, when you look in the mirror, who do you want to see looking back at you? What do you want to see there? Who do you, want to, who do you know personally that you can have some coffee with more often so that whatever they've got, you can learn and let it rub off on you. Who, what saint are you so interested in that you, you want to just read all about them? You want to read everything you can about Desmond Tutu so you can forgive like Desmond forgave. Who, who do you see in the movies that you want to be more like? I mean, you can find examples of saints anywhere you look if you are looking for them. Who do you see in the movies that you want to imitate? The only caveat is the person who you choose to imitate, the people you choose to imitate, you've got to be able to know them well enough to imitate them, right? We can't imitate Paul because he's dead. But I can imitate people who are alive now or have live, writ, left us enough written material so that we can get to know them pretty well. Now, reading this letter, there's not only the question of who do you imitate, but the also even more interesting question of who's imitating you? Who's imitating? Some eyes just got wide. That's the appropriate response, right? Who is imitating you? Someone is. Sometimes it's obvious. Next picture. It, sometimes it's very obvious who's imitating you. Yesterday, Olivia made some uh, almond pound cake. Very tasty. Had some strawberries on top of it. Great dessert. But... Uh, and Sophia, I taught Sophia how to lick the bowl, right? Sometimes it's very obvious who's imitating you, and it's very obvious what they're learning from you. She now knows how to lick the bowl, and that's a very important life skill. <laughs> very important. But it's an amazing question for me to look in the mirror and think, what? She's going to grow up and imitate me. Ugh, that's kind of scary, right? And there are people who are imitating you, whether you realize it or not. Because of the way you live, they are going to see that and say, I can do the same. 
Is your life worthy of imitation? Is your life worthy of imitation? Which is not saying that your life is perfect, because Lord knows my life's not perfect. I can't teach Sophia to imitate me in being perfect. What I can teach her is to imitate me in being quick to ask forgiveness, quick to repent, quick, quick to confess. I don't want my daughter to ever be confused about the fact that if I'm wrong, I'm going to tell her and I'm going to confess to her. Whether she is two, I've already confessed when I've done her wrong already, or whether she's 22. I want her to imitate that in me, so I've got to be imitatable. Is your life imitatable? Is your life worthy of imitation? Paul writes this letter, and he's not writing it because he has an axe to grind. He writes it because he wants to check in with his church that he loves so dearly, and he wants them to continue to thrive and to grow. He wishes to be with them, that he can, but he can't be. He had to, well, he got run out of town, and so it happens. But he's checking in with them to tell them they're doing great and to help them to continue to grow. And what they need to do is to imitate him. Imitate him and... and the fact that that's what he asks of them so that they can grow leaves us the same question. Who are you going to imitate so that you might grow in your faith in Jesus Christ? And how are you going to attend to your life so that your life is imitatable by those who look up to you? This is what Paul wants the church at Thessalonica to think about as he encourages them, as he prepares them to grow in their faith. And if we do the same thing, so can we. Amen.